Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Vision Live. For Real Vision, I'm Max Weethy. Today, we're joined by Tavi Costa, the uh, partner and portfolio manager at Crescott Capital. Uh, Tavi, thank you for joining us today. Max, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Tudo bem? Tudo bem, tudo bem. All right. <laughs> It's great to have a, a Brazilian on. I took a little bit in college and you know, I, I'm very rusty, but every now and then I like to, to break it out. It's, it's just so much fun to speak. It's all in the cheek. And I honestly think it sounds like Russian sometimes. Really? When, uh, when you hear, I, I had a few professors who were from like Angola and mm -hmm. they, it was crazy trying to understand that accent. But um, thank you for joining us. And I know you're, uh, you're down in Florida trapped in in the heart of the coronavirus uh pandemic right now so thank you for for joining us um before we get started i'd love to just open the floor for you to talk a little bit about crescott capital what you do there and a little bit about your firm sure um so i'm a, a co-portfolio manager of crescott capital with kevin smith uh, we're a global macro hedge fund we manage uh four strategies right now. So it's a global macro uh, hedge fund and a long short hedge fund. And then we also have two other separate managed accounts, a large cap and a precious metals uh, only uh, separate managed account too. Uh, we're going to be launching another hedge fund uh, in the end of the month, actually, uh, which will be only focused in precious metals as well. Um, but uh, we uh, mostly focus on building a lot of systematic uh, macro and fundamental equity uh, models. Um, at Crescent, and I'm involved in most of those and creating a lot of the macro themes that ends up actually guiding us on, on building and developing a lot of the macro themes that we have in the portfolio. And today we have, I would say, three major uh, or high conviction themes in the, in the portfolio, which is uh, the China credit and currency bubble. Uh, we have also the global economic uh, downturn in the business cycle that we've been uh, also uh, positioned, and also the precious metal side, which is... Uh, uh, almost like uh, what used to be the big short, in our view, this is the big long. <laughs> awesome. Well, I know we have some great charts uh, looking at all of that today. But before we get into the charts, I'd like to talk a little bit more holistically about uh, how you're seeing the market and what it is maybe on, on the sentiment side um, that that is guiding some of your views. Yes, I think the sentiment is 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 mostly euphoric in my views, and I think there's has been a lot of bears capitulating recently. We've had uh, the Robinhood traders uh, sort of trashing a lot of the in-depth research from 10Ks and 10Qs, mocking Warren Buffett, um, investors bid, uh, bidding essentially all the uh, bankrupt companies and, and saying fundamentals don't matter, the stocks only go up. Uh, at the same time as you have you know profit margins falling apart. Um, we don't see any capex estimates uh, really improving and catching up and uh, recently. So the macro environment seems uh, severely impaired in my view. Uh, I think most people would agree with that. And I think most of the bull case really rests on liquidity from the Federal Reserve on, and a fiscal stimulus. Uh, but in my view, I think the Powell is, it has unlimited power and most people know that, but it, it's also painted into a corner. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, I think it can keep printing money and, and have precious metals, gold, silver, and miners surge, uh, which has been happening uh, recently, uh, or it can just stop it all and, and let the whole market collapse. Um, so we are big uh, proponents of the idea of buying gold and selling stocks, uh, especially if you can buy gold in, versus the most overvalued currencies in the world, which would be the Chinese currency in our view and the Hong Kong dollar. But going back to your question, I think the Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1 to get a month's access to this incredible content. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Uh, especially if you can buy gold in versus the most overvalued currencies in the world, which would be the Chinese currency in our view and the Hong Kong dollar. 
But going back to your question, I think the biggest point here is, are we going to see a revamp of economic growth going forward, at least in, in the following months? And in our view, we're not seeing that according to the data. Um, so we're continuing to position ourselves uh, into uh, thinking that we're probably going to be seeing further monetary stimulus and therefore gold, silver and precious metals will continue to move higher. And at some point, uh, we believe there is a business cycle and, and equity markets at record valuations look quite appealing on the short side. Okay. So we a lot of it, you talked about monetary stimulus. We do have some big uh, deadlines coming up in terms of fiscal stimulus here in the U.S. with the CARES Act um, kind of coming to an end, and there really isn't anything that looks like it's going to be passed anytime soon. I think right before I came on the call, I was scrolling through Twitter, and you know, Mark Cuban was saying, "Call your senators uh, because this stimulus is about to run out." How much of a focus is your firm placing on uh, the fiscal stimulus relative to the monetary stimulus? Because it's definitely taken a bigger a bigger role than it has in previous crises. Yes, it's certainly a more direct way of, of uh, intervening in the markets, in my view, uh, um, in especially, I would say, in the economy, not even in the markets. Um, and the Federal Reserve has been certainly funding a lot of, a lot of the, the fiscal stimulus. I think most people would uh, probably agree with that. In our view, what we're seeing is a withdrawal of liquidity. We just had close to $700 billion uh, in the last month of July, I would say, uh, of, of, of uh, government borrowings. Um, and when you look at that, also, we also had the Federal Reserve actually uh, withdraw liquidity from the markets as well. Um, in the last four weeks, or actually the last week, not this one, um, the, market, uh, the Federal Reserve actually, uh, the balance sheet declined, but its largest amount in history of, of, of it. And it's, it's quite interesting, along with uh, the borrowings that we're seeing. Um, so certainly, uh, we're on the side where uh, we believe there is a liquidity withdrawal, and it's it's uh, it's difficult to even justify valuations and the record leverage situation we are at today in the markets. Um, also, I think the support is is tremendous, and it has to be uh, it has to continue in the markets, and therefore why I think the precious metals will continue to rise. Uh, and from that, I'm talking about mostly the corporate bond market. Um, I mean, look at the corporate bond market. Corporate yields uh, today, the bond yields. Is are at record lows right now, and it makes no sense. Uh, that is is just rising at an unprecedented level right now, um, and the only reason for that is really the Federal Reserve uh, support uh, that continues to uh, to give a lot of those yields, um, you know, support to continue to move lower. Um, at some point, you know, I, I don't think that they 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 can actually uh, allow this market to, to um, move in a normal way. So. Um, I think we're going to continue to see this uh, support from uh, from the government and, and from the Federal Reserve. Um, and therefore, I think gold will continue to move higher in that scenario. Um, but I think, yes, I think there's some of the, especially the unemployment um, uh, packages, I think will be uh, critical for the equity markets going forward. And we have elections coming up, too. Uh, we just had uh, corporate taxes and net receipts uh, declined by somewhere close to 90 percent. I just put out a chart on that. And it's it's incredible. Um, you know, so uh, what's what's happening here is that there's no even uh, support from the from the tax revenue side from corporations and, and consumers. Um, so um, uh, the government is broke. Uh, I think most people would agree with that as well. Um, and uh, and so the Federal Reserve has to continue to be the, the less buyer of less resource here in terms of the treasuries uh, in the markets. And it, it has been doing that. Um, and it suppresses long term rates and expands the monetary base. And. I, I think we're gonna. I think this is only the beginning of of that type of those types of policies. Well, you said the government is broke, and you could argue that there is very there are very few governments around the world that aren't broke, and that tends to play itself out in the currency market, which is I think why you mentioned uh, owning gold versus the most overvalued currencies, um, and specifically the Chinese yuan. Could you talk a little bit about the mechanics of buying gold in in not just yuan, but a currency that is not your home currency? What is that like? Um, who has access to that? Is that something that, say, a retail investor could do, or do you do you really have to be a professional to buy gold in, say, the yuan? I wouldn't say so much as a professional, but certainly you need a, a certain amount of capital in order to. Uh, uh, to put the trade on, especially the CNH and uh, and the HKDs that are a little bit a little bit easier, uh, you need a is the agreement number one, 
in order to uh, to be navigating into that space uh, for uh, for the CNHs and, and CNYs, in other words, the Chinese currencies. Um, so uh, I, I just believe we're in an economic conundrum, uh, not just in the U.S., but globally. And uh, certainly, I think we're in the race to the bottom for fiat currencies. And uh, and the dollar looks fundamentally better than any other currency that I can I can think of. Um, it's quite interesting what's happening. For instance, when you look at balance sheets all over the world, um, you know the, the Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet has been surging uh, to the upside in terms of assets. Uh, but if you look at the PBOC's balance sheet, uh, it hasn't been growing at the same level, and that's because, in my view, um, there is a, a sort of an unlimited. Uh, uh, position for a lot of uh, foreign central banks to print money in the same uh, degree that we're seeing here in, in the U.S. Um, so I, I'm a big believer of the idea that we have a dollar shortage problem uh, outside of the U.S. and and because of the debt denominated liabilities uh, that have accumulated over the years. And I think that that's uh, uh, that will continue to create a problem, especially with emerging markets. Um, so I think China is kind of uh, in, in the center of a lot of the crediting balances we have in the world today. Um, so there's enough reasons uh, for you to uh, um, to be short the Chinese currency, in my view. But answering your question, why we like gold in, in renminbi terms, especially, I, I believe it's because um, when you do uh, empirical analysis in terms of what happens when you have a credit bust, uh, especially in emerging markets, what it tends to happen is sometimes you have equity markets rising, sometimes you have the currencies collapsing. Um, like in Brazil, actually, in 1994 or so, um, when the currency, the real, uh, started to collapse, uh, we, oh, we actually had uh, equity markets in local currency terms rising significantly. So if you short the equity market in local currencies, you lost a lot of money. Um, now, uh, one thing that is a pattern that we found in a lot of emerging markets uh, credit bubbles that burst in the past is that uh, gold in local currency terms tends to rise. Um, and I agree 100 percent with a lot of people is that gold hasn't really worked, especially as uh, you would expect uh, for the last uh, decade or so. More recently, yes, uh, here in the U.S. But when you look at places like Brazil, um, Turkey, uh, even China, gold has been rising uh, significantly for the last years or so. So uh, that is the, an important part. Also, when you look at for the last five years uh, of the major currencies in the world today, and you look at the performance relative to the dollar, actually the Chinese currency has been one of the worst ones. I believe last time I checked in the last five years, uh, it was the second worst one. Um, and you know, not a lot of people know that, but this uh, the Chinese currency has been devaluing for some time now. Um, it just hasn't happened all all at once uh, the way we thought it would. And I, I still think there's a really high probability we could see uh, a major devaluation of the yuan in the next two to three years. Okay, so we actually got two questions here related to that from Patrick Bateman. So I'm assuming that that's a pseudonym for somebody stealing that from the uh, American psycho. Um, but what will be the trigger for a devaluation in the yuan? Do you think it's going to be? Do you think it's going to be one of those things where we wake up and it's at eight or something like that, or? Is this going to be a slow grind? And then, as well, Patrick asked a question about, do you think gold denominated in yuan will outperform gold denominated in dollars? I think, obviously, since your firm is 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 actively putting on that trade, I, I would say it, the answer is yes. Yes. The, the, se the second question I, I would answer as yes. Uh, the, the, the first question, I think the premise of her thesis in China started with uh, the credit scenario. Um, I, I think it could happen all at once. If you ask me, my I think the probability is higher that something like that would happen uh, than, uh, than a gradual devaluation, which is something that we have seen for the last five years. So going forward, uh, I believe that being positioned uh, for a big move all of a sudden, I think that, that that's a smart position. It's something that we've been doing at Crescat. Uh, actually, um, our position today in terms of Chinese renminbi and the Hong Kong dollar shorts, it's somewhere close to 900% of the, our NAV. And that's given um, a lot of that is because we can get a very uh, risk, very low uh, premium amount um, of, through option markets uh, in this uh, in the currency markets. And, um, and, and because of the low implied volatility, it, it allows you to get a bigger exposure in, in the nominal terms. 
Um, but the premise of the whole thesis uh, really is because of the credit situation. We've done a lot of work, especially on the property developers that look a lot like the property developers of the home builders of the U.S. here. Uh, we calculated um, just the free cash flow accumulated uh, amount of, since the global financial crisis, and we saw somewhere close to losses of $300 billion in the property developments in China. At the same time, as it accumulated close to $650 billion of net debt. Um, so that's you know that's not a usual um, uh, uh, development in in the property, uh, especially markets in general, real estate market, um, and also you know just the banking system. The size of the banking system certainly looks uh, alarming relative to the size of a very inflated GDP in our view, um, somewhere close to uh, uh, you know 45 trillion dollars of of assets on balance sheet today in China. It's it's ab absurd. Uh, relative to a, an economy that we highly doubt is anywhere close to $15 trillion of, of GDP today. Uh, there's no way. Um, and especially uh, since the global financial crisis, China was responsible for somewhere close to 60 percent of global uh, GDP. Uh, at the same time, I mean, China was uh, the largest bias, a buyer of, of commodities. And, and why in the world commodities had its last, uh, it's one of its worst decades in history. Um, so a lot of things don't match, and I, I'm not, I don't think that uh, I'm telling you any surprise here. I think a lot of people agree with me on that. Uh, but the current account problem is, is, is another issue that we've, uh, we've pointed out. I even have a chart uh, a long time ago on that, uh, which shows uh, the net decline of, of current accounts uh, relative to, uh, to also the, the, uh, the, the link between that and the depreciation of currencies over time. One of them would be Argentina that lost somewhere close to 90 or so percent of its value of, of its currency since the global financial crisis. At the same time as the current account of Argentina uh, shrinked significantly, um, there are so many other examples like that. Um, and the ones that have uh, been shrinking in, in terms of current account it certainly is um, China is a huge part of that. Um, and Saudi Arabia would be another one. Uh, and most of the companies that fall into this quadrant uh, would be uh, economies that actually have pegged currencies. Um, anyways, it's it's another leg of our portfolio, and it's, I think it gives another level of asymmetry to the trade of being long gold, um, and why not being long gold versus the most overvalued currencies in the world. Um, so I think China is is a big proponent of uh, of, of being that. Um, and Hong Kong as well. And it, as I said, it's uh, relatively cheap to uh, to add that to a portfolio today. Okay, so I have uh, actually, I can't claim this thought process as my own, but we had somebody who wrote into us, saw that you were coming on and has been following you for a while. And they had a question about, um, it's a question you've actually been asked on, on Real Vision recently, which is why now for the Chinese credit bubble? Is there anything specific about this that, has you to believe that it's going to be a problem sooner rather than later, because this isn't a new story. It's yep. been around for a while. We've heard these theses before, and it hasn't really played out. The Chinese government has has been willing to to back these, you know, ghost cities. Um, and then as well, assuming it does play out, uh, do you think there is a potential for um, for imported deflation into the rest of the world as as prices fall in China and and the prices of of our goods? Uh, fall with it. Uh, well, I, I, I would uh, slightly disagree that it hasn't really played out. I think it has uh, it has been playing out slowly, especially in terms of the currency, as I've, I've pointed out, uh, it depreciated more than a lot of other developed economies um, uh, that have uh, other major um, um, currencies out, out there. And that, what, what I think it's important here is looking at the cost of capital of, of China. When you when you build such a level of, of a debt imbalance in a country, which is the case in China, I think it's important to uh, to be looking for, uh, especially corporate defaults, with something that was especially rising a few months ago. It's still rising, um, but uh, food inflation has been at levels that we haven't seen in a long time. It's right now close to food CPI in China. Last time I checked, was somewhere close to 11 percent year over year. Um, and also you have pork prices is still up about 80 percent year over year. Um, so I, I think all those things uh, could certainly derail into a, a more of a bursting scenario, as you were uh, pointing it out. Uh, we've had, you know, the, the issues with Australia recently. I think Australia and Canada have a lot of links to China, number one. Um, and you are starting to see some uh, some signs in especially in Australian housing market uh, in terms of credit growth is starting to contract. 
uh, which is, is a housing market that depends on capital outflows that have been exacerbating a lot of the real estate prices in, that, in those markets. Um, now, in terms of why now, I, I believe that that's the, the situation has to do a little bit with the virus situation and the relations between uh, not just China and the U.S., but China relative to the entire world. I think that the virus spread, regardless how you call it, uh, China virus, COVID, whatever that is, um, it's certainly unmasked in my view, a lot of um, the um, a, a lot of what uh, the truth about the CCP or the China Communist Party uh, has been coming out to the world recently. Um, so I think I think that when you look at the the fundamentals in the macro environment in China, we're not seeing freight traffic, for instance, um, rising at all. It's it's actually in a, it's still negative on a year over year basis. We see personal mortgages still declining. It's not picking up at all in China. We see imports is still down the double digits uh, type of numbers. Um, you know, iron ore imports are, are heading south again. They're not rising. So there's quite a lot of reasons in terms of the macro um, indicators that we look at China that are not confirming a revamp of growth. Another th part that is important about, I think, about China is, is about your outlook about the global economy. If you don't believe that China, if you believe that China has reached, uh, reached a level of, of credit exhaustion, which I think it's very close to, if not have reached that already, um, you know, how do you, how do you believe that the world is going to come back to a normal uh, or a revamp situation in terms of organic growth economically in the following months? I think that that's the big question. Um, and I think that that's going to be really hard to see uh, that, you know, that, that kind of uh, uh, revamp of growth in general worldwide. Uh, and because of that, um, it goes back to, I think, that shorting the Chinese currency uh, in terms of all those arguments I've just spoke about, um, I think it makes a ton of sense. Um, and I think those are the reasons of why now. Um, in terms of the Taiwan and Hong Kong situation, certainly have intensified in the last few years, uh, especially in the last few months and weeks, um, especially Hong Kong. Um, and I'm not, I don't, I don't believe that that's going to get any better anytime soon. Um, if you think that the, the, the PBOC will likely um, start picking up in terms of money printing here very soon, in my view, um, I think it's quite difficult to continue to see this, uh, um, this, this change in terms of uh, uh, the Fed's balance sheet surpassing the size of the PBOC's balance sheet, which that's the first time that that happened in the last uh, 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 17, uh, 14 years or so. It's uh, uh, quite the record uh, uh, th that we just saw. Um, and I, I think what we're going to see is most likely we're going to see the PBOC starting to dilute its currency again. Um, and, and therefore, we're going to see uh, further devaluation going forward. It's, it's hard for me to even think about um, how to conceptualize a, a, a bullish case for the, for the yuan going forward. I can see um, a world where um, the rest of the world will be actually doing more trading with China versus the other way around. Um, so anyways, I think there's quite a lot of reasons for why now, but certainly the credit situation and, and the lack of economic growth worldwide, I think will probably um, um, you know, intensify this issue going forward. So let's say you can't participate in buying gold in the yuan. Are you also bullish on gold relative to, say, the dollar, which it sounds like you have a, a pretty bullish view on that as well? Do you think that gold in these traditional safer currencies is also going to perform, maybe not as well as it would against against the Chinese currency, but still bullish? Yeah, I, I think there's another way as well to uh, to add. Uh, that's a that's a good idea. Number one, the number two would be looking for emerging markets. Um, in general, currencies uh, look uh, that look attractive. The only issue is that a lot of the emerging market currencies don't have the same level of uh, of cheapness in terms of how you you can um, expose yourself uh, to those. Um, the same way you can have 900 percent of uh, of, of your NAV on nominal exposure to the Chinese and the Hong Kong dollar, you probably won't be able to do the same cheap way with that with the Brazilian real, uh, for instance. Um, now, not, there's another interesting way you could play that, uh, in my view, which is uh, through buying uh, precious metals miners um, outside of, of the U.S. In other words, companies that have uh, a lot of FX exposure, um, especially uh, in relate, uh, related to their costs. Um, so, you know, it's another way of being long gold uh, versus the most overvalued currencies in the world today. So those companies that have significant FX exposure as their currencies depreciate, especially in the emerging markets, you would expect that to boost their margin. So their costs would be cheaper because they're uh, priced in uh, foreign currencies at the same time as the metal price would, would likely rise in a scenario 
uh, like uh, I'm, I'm referring to. So I think that that's just another way of, of, of playing this, you know, gold uh, in, in, in any other currency that you believe will likely devalue. There are plenty of miners in places like Argentina, Brazil, uh, Mexico, even Canada, Australia. Um, you know, even even places that are that have a, a higher uh, dependency or links uh, with the Chinese economy. Um, again, that has nothing to do with what's happening in China. But if the dollar will appreciate versus the, those currencies, you would expect that the costs of uh, of of, um, of those companies would actually improve significantly. And um, and so I, I think that's just a, a smart way of uh, of of of, of ex getting ex exposed to this idea. Remember, miners just had. Um, you know their best quarter ever, ever um, for this this whole industry. Um, over 44 percent above the S and P 500, um, even 30 percent above the tech stocks. Um, even Bitcoin, uh, I think, was 20 percent over Bitcoin. So you know it's it's it's, a, it's certainly an industry that that could uh, benefit significantly going forward here from from a, a world that could look like um, you know this race to the bottom for a lot of fiat currencies. Do you worry at all about jurisdictional risk? Are there any miners in the world that you won't touch because of the jurisdictions that they're in? I think there are some issues uh, regarding that, um, uh, no doubt. Um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of, uh, you know, there's certainly a lack of new discoveries all over the world um, in terms of gold and silver deposits. And a lot of those uh, new discoveries that we're finding that we've been allocating a lot of capital to recently uh, are in jurisdictions that are not the most desirable places. But uh, I think there has been an improvement in some areas, um, such as um, even Bolivia or 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 um, or Peru um, or you know Mexico, some places that you still uh, could somehow um, find exposure there that is uh, that that could be interesting with with taking some stakes in places uh, in in deposits that we think are very prolific and perhaps could even be world class deposits in a few, year, a few years um, uh, th that could turn out to be uh, very interesting. Some places in Africa were not so exposed uh, currently, but there, there are great miners in, in Australia, um, um, really great, incredible miners in, in areas like Australia and Canada um, that are very safe jurisdictions that you can still find very valuable uh, um, companies uh, in those areas. Drill stories uh, that obviously you need a, a lot of the, the uh, geologic expertise in order to navigate that market. Uh, we've partnered with uh, a, a world-class geologist, um, uh, Quentin Haney, which is the, the chairman uh, and president of, uh, of Novo Resources in Australia, one of our largest positions. And, uh, you know, uh, he's um, he worked for the uh, for Newmont in terms of exploration for over 15 years, and incredibly smart guy. Uh, but there are other ways you could, uh, you could look for um, you know, forms to uh, to navigate in this in this segment of of the industry. I think the overall industry will uh, will continue to move higher, and, and it's just I'm looking for uh, what what are the the, the cheapest uh, parts of the uh, and segments of this of this industry. And I think the drill stories look quite interesting. Okay, well, I know you brought some good charts relative to the gold miners, and we have some charts though in front of that that I'd like to get through. Um, we looked at the corporate debt versus bond yields, money printing versus the economy. We have some charts. Uh, you brought a table on valuations that I think would be a good place to go because you said you're short equities, global equities, but we haven't really talked about that at all. Why don't we talk about these valuations and a little bit about that side of your portfolio? Yes. Um, as I said, I think uh, it's it's very interesting when you look at the, the case, the bull case, which uh, really rests on liquidity, but we're actually seeing a withdrawal of liquidity and even uh, the Federal Reserve has been reversing a lot of its policies um, that that uh, support the bullish thesis. But you know, still, if you look at the valuations and that table you're referring to, I believe there are seven multiples there. They're basically at all-time highs right now, and I know they're actually not at all-time highs. But we're using Q1 numbers. Um, Q2 numbers will be coming out. Most likely, we're going to be at a 100th percentile across the board, in my view. Um, now, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because a lot of the tech stocks have actually been masking a lot of the, uh, the performance of, of indices in general. Um, if you look at the median stock in the Russell 3000 today, ex, um, excluding the, the, the tech stocks today, uh, it's down close to 20%. Um, and a lot, not a lot of people know that. In a, on the fundamental side, there's a sector that I think is one of the most critical sectors today, consumer discretionary. 
you look at the earnings for that, it's supposed to be down close to 60%. Um, so it's it's interesting this um, the valuations that we have in the markets today. Uh, the tech sector today is is represents close to 37 percent of of the S and P 500. Um, that's that's you know, but that's including I, I did that calculation including Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google because um, you know that they would be included back in 2000 if the when the calculation. Uh, uh, is comparing um, the the level of uh, of of the size of the, this sector relative to the S and P 500. Back then, it was close to 35 percent, and right at the peak of the dot com bubble. Today, it's two percentage points higher. Um, and some people may say, well, but you know, revenues is a big portion of the S and P is coming from the tech sector. It's actually 10 percent. Um, so, so how do you reconcile that? 10 percent of the S and P 500. Uh, revenues of the S&P 500 are coming from the tech sector, but the tech sector represents 37 percent of of this um, uh, of the S&P. So quite interesting uh, uh, stats uh, in terms of that. But um, again, I think that there is um, a money printing doesn't fix the economy. It doesn't fix the economic activity. And certainly we've seen a divergence between that in which you've seen the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve rising and at the same time as, as almost every uh, macro indicator has, has been going south, not, not north. And, and so um, I, just, I just think that the, the real question you got to ask yourself is, are we going to see a revamp of growth or uh, we're going to see a continuation of, of policies like this uh, in which should be continue to support um, the precious metal side. And uh, I always ask the other question, which is if you're looking for growth, growth stocks, that's not on tech stocks. Um, that's not on tech stocks that is not in industrials, not on banks. Um, so the, the, the real growth story is actually in miners. Uh, miners are supposed to double their free cash flow uh, in, the next, in this next quarter. Um, something that never happened in, the, in this industry before. At the same time as you have CapEx, actually, uh, when you look at CapEx, uh, the cycle of, of this mining industry, it tends to actually follow gold prices very closely. It's a very interesting chart. Aggregate CapEx versus gold prices, and you see as gold prices rise, you see companies spending more money. It makes sense. But recently, we're not seeing that. We're seeing a divergence of CapEx actually not rising as much as gold prices have been rising. I'm referring to CapEx for precious metals industry. And uh, I think that part of that is, is because um, a lot of companies think that they are, again, in 2016 environment in which gold prices begin to rise and then it pause for two to three years. Um, and so I think companies are a little reluctant to spend capital in general overall, not just in the mining space. Um, and you know that will have an impact, continue to have an impact in labor markets. Uh, and other uh, fundamental parts of the economy, very important pillars of the economy. So the capital intensive businesses are not spending money um, as CapEx continues to fall. And, and we're not seeing you know, the, the rocket ship recovery that most have been uh, betting on recently. So I think valuations make no sense at the levels that they are today. Uh, we have low yields, we have pretty much record valuations and record debt. Um, and I think that in an environment like this, it will be hard to see uh, a revamp of growth, economically speaking. Okay. So we have a whole bunch of charts here for precious metals in the miners. We've been talking a lot about gold, but you brought a chart of silver uh, comparing, you know, this, this period right now back with the great financial crisis. How is your fund thinking about silver or other precious metals outside of gold? That's a good question. I, I think silver is a. Uh, I think most people would agree it's a leveraged way of of playing the gold prices moving higher. Very difficult. You'll be rich, rich being buying buying gold, but uh, uh, so, uh, but, but silver certainly offers more of that uh, asymmetric bet in terms of uh, uh, of the gold prices and silver to uh, to. Uh, um, to gold ratio uh, or gold to silver ratio continues close to 93 or so, 94 last time I checked, which is about you know 66 percent or so uh, higher than uh, than the historical average. Uh, back in 2011, this ratio got close to 31, for instance, uh, which I think it's very possible we can see a scenario like this. So you know, in terms of uh, also, if you look at the a silver to equities ratio, is another way to look almost like a, a perfect double bottom. Uh, by that, you, you just look at silver relative to Russell 3000. I've been talking about this chart for some time now. I continue to believe that silver will continue to outperform equity markets. I think that that's just in the beginning 
Um, and we've had precious metals really outperforming the equity markets uh, since the, the March lows uh, so far. Um, I think we need to break that 2016 uh, highs, uh, which was uh, somewhere close to $20.60 and, and an ounce. Um, and uh, we already have silver prices in terms of the uh, uh, um, in the physical market already trading above significantly above 20. So I think it's a matter of time for that. The chart you're referring to, um, we we're looking at the Fed amount of money printing we had uh, back in, in late 08, which I think was somewhere close to 1.2 or so trillion dollars in about four months. Um, and silver went parabolic for the next two years. Uh, we just did somewhere close to what uh, two, uh, three, almost uh, over two times that amount uh, recently. And I think there's tremendous opportunity still ahead for silver. It's just starting to move higher. Uh, and as we continue to here to break to new levels, um, regardless if it is uh, you know reaching higher levels in 2016, I think we're heading uh, north here, and I think we're going to go a lot higher. And there's a big chance we can even go exponentially higher uh, to a more parabolic move. And are you playing that in the same way with owning miners or against maybe emerging market currencies, or is this something you're you're doing in dollars? Um, so we have three positions in the precious metals to make it simple: um, gold uh, in the futures market, silver in the futures market. And those are in dollars, um, and then we have, in terms of the mining space, um, we have um, you know uh, allocation towards the entire the entire industry, mostly in the junior. Uh, exploration side uh, right now because they have been growing as a position as they have been working. Um, and uh, we believe that we're in the early stages of a bull market for precious metals. And as we get to the more later stages, I think we're going to move towards um, you know the, the junior uh, producers and then senior producers and then even royalties at some point. Uh, I think moving towards that, um, it's probably a smart uh, idea in my view. Um, and uh, but but yes, um, uh, to remind you, it's there. You know the way we play this gold and versus other currencies uh, is it's uh, is in two separate trades. So it's being long gold in dollar terms, and then being short the renminbi or being short any emerging market currency or the Hong Kong dollar, and uh, and that will give you mathematically that means you're long gold uh, and short other um, other currencies, and and that means you're long gold and versus the most overvalued currencies that you view or I view. Uh, in the world today, so that's that's the way we uh, we are exposed in, in in the funds. Okay. Well, we have a couple of other charts that I'd like to run through. We just um, we just kind of jumped around a little bit. Um, let's see. You have one here that's Apple versus the entire precious metals industry. Uh, talk to me a little bit about this chart and why you think um, maybe this gap is going to be closed. Isn't that insane? I mean, how how does one company is worth three times the size of of, of an entire industry? I mean, I don't care what company it is. I actually have nothing against Apple. I think Apple is one of the healthiest companies uh, that I look at in the S and P 500 today. Uh, now, how in the world one company is worth three times the size of a whole a whole industry, especially is the only industry in the world that should benefit from all this is happening in terms of monetary experiment that we're seeing uh, today. It's it's important to remember that today. The, the precious metal space uh, or industry is represents close less than one percent of the of the global equity markets today. Um, again, if we're going to continue to see more money printing, I think this industry will rise um, exponentially going forward. Um, I always joke this, but uh, on, on a joke on this, but it's it's actually true. I mean, uh, just think about when Robinhood traders actually learn about all this gold and silver penny stocks. They're going to go parabolic. <laughs> I, I really, I really believe in that. Um, I, again, uh, when you when you compare buying any tech company today trading at 30, 40, 60, 70 times sales, while you can buy a miner trading at five times. Uh, five times free cash flow. I mean, look at the difference in multiples. I mean, this seems pretty obvious that there's an imbalance there. Um, I, I don't think those companies will be trading at those discounts for, for much longer, in my view. Uh, we're going to see a, a, a big run up for miners going forward, especially if the Federal Reserve will continue to do what they have been doing to fund fiscal stimulus. So um, again, there's election years. Uh, this is an election year, too. Um, another another thing to think about, uh, but I believe strongly that when you put when you put just just the mining uh, sector, the mining uh, industry as a sector, 
Um, it, it has the cleanest balance sheets that you can find today. I mean, I think that it's uh, somewhere in the median um, total debt to assets in the mining space today, somewhere close to 17 percent. Uh, there are no other sectors with the same level of, 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 of how clean this looks in terms of balance sheet. Um, the median uh, total debt to total assets today in S and P 500, for instance, is close to 35 percent. And so, I you know I, I can't stress enough uh, how fundamentally, macro and technically, uh, the mining space looks attractive uh, for the following months. Yeah, and it's it's ironic too because that has kind of been the thesis behind why the big mega cap tech stocks have have been outperforming is that they have these sort of iron balance sheets with so much free cash flow that if you're looking for a safe asset that's there. So it, in some ways, it plays into that same trade, which has been working recently, um, at least in the in the big run up that we've seen in equities. Um, we have Jim Edsel has a question about any specific miners that you like. He asked about junior miners. Um, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about going into individual names, a lot of people who come on uh, when they talk about miners, they just recommend GDX or GDXJ. How do you guys think about going into individual names, and what are some of the things that you think are important if you are going to step away from the uh, sector ETFs? Yeah, look, we're actually not playing uh, uh, ETFs in, in, our, in our funds. I'll mention a few names here uh, of, of companies we've been uh, especially taking more of an activist approach. Uh, and we really started, I mean, the, the whole um, uh, global uh, fiat debasement theme in, in our portfolio started. It's one of our longest running themes, actually. Um, but we've intensified our, our, uh, our process in, in the last year or so when we opened a, a separate managed account, only focused on what we view the, the best miners in the world today. Um, and then we partnered with this um, geologist, Quentin Haney, as well. That was a big step uh, for us. So, so kind of marrying this uh, macro expertise um, and macro process along with the fundamental process and, and, and the, the geology part that I think it's, it's uh, uh, critical for this industry. Uh, I think it's, it's helpful uh, to identify what are the best companies in the world today in terms of that. Um, for a retail investor, I think it's important to understand the, the difference in the industry. You know, if your, uh, your risk appetite is, is in, uh, as, as high as, uh, as other people, I think the royalties and the senior producers might be the way to go. Uh, the junior producers is pro probably where you find a lot of those uh, five, uh, ten times uh, free cash flow multiples I was referring to is not so much on the seniors. Um, and then there is more of the, the the drill story segment of the industry that is a little harder to uh, um, um, to price uh, in terms of uh, or to value in, in general. I think you have to have a, a little bit of uh, or a strong uh, background in terms of uh, geology. Um, Could and you explain you that what that is? Those are those are mines that aren't producing. They're purely they own a piece of dirt and they're they're doing geological surveys to see yeah. how valuable that piece of dirt actually could be. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Um, and uh, again, as I said before, supply has been so constrained in this industry, and I believe that uh, a lot of the, the bigger companies in the space will be looking for the best deposits in the world today. So, you know, the early you know drill stories that you refer that you just explained are the ones that probably will be sitting on properties that have very valuable projects. Uh, will probably be bid up by by a lot of the the bigger companies uh, very soon. Um, so I, I think that that's uh, where a lot of the opportunity is. We've been taking more the activist stake um, in, in those companies uh, to fund uh, you know fund them and and help them to uh, to advance a lot of those projects um, in terms of uh, of drilling uh, and getting better results and also helping them. It's a more friendly approach uh, in terms of activism. Um, and adding, you know, some financial and geologic expertise uh, by helping them with uh, with having Quentin Henney being part of their team as well. Um, and I think the other part that is being very difficult in this industry is helping them to tell the, the, the story. Um, and that's where I've been uh, focused on uh, for the last few months and, and trying to tell a better story about the mining space in general uh, by looking at fundamentally and, and proving to people that there is, if you want to be looking for growth, I don't think that growth is in the tech stocks at all. Uh, and most people have been focusing on that or banks uh, with yields probably going negative. I mean, there, there's not much of a attractiveness in my view as, as an investor in those sectors. I think that the mining space looks incredibly attractive. 
um, especially given the asymmetry that it could have uh, if, if, if metal prices continue to move higher. I think the overall industry will move higher, but uh, you know, if we can hit some home runs uh, by finding the best projects in the world, I think that that's, uh, that's an even better approach. So that's, uh, that's why we're launching this, this new hedge fund um, in which we'll be focusing a lot of private, um, uh, private placements where you can find a lot of discounts uh, in terms of prices and you can find deals with uh, much cheaper uh, uh, discounts that you can find in, in obviously public markets in general. So, uh, uh, and they come with warrants. Um, so I think that uh, a lot of those deals were not, were not, are not gonna be available in the following months. I think that we're, uh, uh, the, the whole industry is, is starting to take off. Uh, and I think that's a very good thing, but at the same time, we all wish we were bigger. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, I, it's it's a good time uh, right now in my view. I, I, I think gold prices have just began to really rise and uh, the precious metals industry is still, like, like I said, less than 1% of the overall equity market globally, so. Well, I, I hate to hold you to it, but do we have any names? Oh yeah, um, I wrote it down here. So one of our largest positions would be Novo Resources. It's another um, a company um, that will be probably starting production soon. Um, that's uh, that's uh, a company that Quentin Haney is involved as well. Um, and other three companies that are extremely small. I'm, I'm just letting you know that it's, those are very small market cap companies, and which allows us to take a one, two, three percent position of our funds. On, on very small companies like that. Um, and, and we take a very significant stake on those companies. Um, so those are, I wrote it down here, Eloro Resources is, is in Bolivia, uh, very interesting deposit. Um, another one would be uh, Condor Resources in Peru. Um, those are all, they, you, can, you can trade them here in the US as well. And the third one would be SK Mining um, as well in, in, uh, in Canada. So those are all interesting, uh, uh, three ideas that we have disclosed already. Uh, we've been doing videos, uh, YouTube videos with Quentin Haney to explain those stories uh, more in a geological way, um, along with our views about the markets. And uh, we'll continue to do that going forward, but our funds will be focusing on doing more of those deals. We have at least 10, 15 deals coming up here soon um, in terms of those names, but those four names would be uh, names that we're very excited about, and those are large positions for Kraska today. Okay. Well, I think we've uh, we've pretty much hammered the the gold mining story to death now. So I do want to open up the floor to some questions from the audience and go back to some of the ones that we missed. We had um, Camille wants to know uh, just your general outlook on Brazil, given given you're a, a, a local. How are you looking at Brazil? Maybe um, the market, the economy, and then also you know there's a big COVID outbreak there as well. Um, are you hearing anything from the people back home about how that is going? Yes, I hear a lot that the you know, uh, in the situation in Brazil is 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 certainly not not as great in terms of the the, the COVID um, spread. However, uh, in terms of markets, um, I I still extremely bearish on the Brazilian real. I think that there is a, a historically there is a very strong link between the Chinese renminbi and the um, and the Brazilian real. So we've seen. Uh, back in even in the 90s, when the Chinese remember the value significantly versus the dollar, we've had um, a, a significant depreciation of the real relative to the dollar as well. I think we'll continue to see that, especially given how uh, the Brazilian central bank is is um, uh, their policies are extremely easy right now, which is quite surprising given an emerging market. It's 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 crazy to see where interest rates are in Brazil today. Um, it almost looks like Brazil is acting like a, a developed economy and certainly isn't. Um, there is a lot of risk politically, um, and I think it's going to spill over in, in, in the foreign uh, in, in the FX market. So I think that the biggest risk for Brazil, for Brazil in general, and for Brazilians is is in the is in the currency markets. Um, I think we'll I think we'll see uh, a handle somewhere close to six or above six for. Uh, for the dollar in, in real terms, or in other words, uh, USD BRL will be trading above six in my view uh, by the end of the year. Um, and in terms of equities, I don't have strong views on equities. They have certainly lagged most of other emerging markets um, recently, especially in China. Uh, but the link between China and, and Brazil is still extremely uh, high. Um, and the links also with cyclical commodities in, in Brazil. So it goes back to the question, usually you see emerging markets are, are very good positions to have in terms of the long side, if you're a believer that we're at the beginning of the business cycle globally. 
I don't think that that's the case here. So I think the Brazilian uh, markets uh, will continue to uh, uh, be challenging, and especially in the in the in, in the currency markets. Um, so I think that that's uh, that would be my my view uh, in in Brazil today. We don't have any positions there right now. Um, actually, we have a small position actually on the short side of the equity side, but it's mostly because of the currency. Uh, it's more of a hedge um, in, in our in our precious metals um, uh, place. But uh, I still believe that um, uh, yeah, that the, the, the real looks uh, looks very uh, fragile going forward here. Okay, we've had people come on before who talked about a currency um, shorting a currency that maybe you can't find exposure to it through an ETF. What do you think about um, using the banks as a proxy for a currency? So shorting maybe Brazilian bank equities because they're exposed to not only the growth story, but as well uh, relatively have high currency risk. Is that something that you would consider or is it you're, you're really muddying the waters too much and you're not getting a pure play? Well, I don't think I uh, personally uh, have a huge edge on terms of, 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 of picking a lot of the companies out there. I think it's very different in terms of a regulatory environment in Brazil. Um, the, a lot of the banks are actually one of the most profitable banks in the world. And when you look at, um, especially net, net interest margins, but with the yields moving lower in Brazil overall, which um, I also think that that's, uh, that's unsustainable um, from whatever you look at, um, you know, the, the short end of the curve and the front, the front end of the curve or the back end of the curve of, of emerging markets, uh, yields uh, look um, incorrect in my view. <laughs> Um, it will probably uh, be moving higher going forward uh, as the currency markets uh, begin to have issues here. Um, so that's a, you know that's a that's a good a good question. I, I I don't have that as a position right now. We have more uh, in EWZ the the ETF uh, yeah. right now. But uh, you know I I still think that there's a it, it's very tough to find a good currency exposure for emerging markets in my view, outside of uh, doing it in a cheap way like you can do with China, or cheaper way uh, you can use China in, in terms of that. Uh, but EWZ is an option uh, in terms of on the short side if you if you have a similar view that we have. OK. Uh, we actually got a question in to ask you if you could repeat those four names in the miners. Sure. Uh, it's Novo Resources uh, in Australia, uh, would be Eloro Resources um, in Bolivia, and Condor Resources uh, in Peru, and then SK Mining, uh, which is in Canada. Okay. Um, now we got a question in that I must confess I haven't heard of this story, um, but Woody Wu wants to know how does the once in a century flood in China affect the world economy, um, specifically supply chains? Was there a big flood recently? Yeah, um, I you know I I don't think I'm the expert to answer that question. That's a tough question. Um, um, yeah, I don't I don't think I'm the right person to uh, to answer that question in that way. But uh, I'm not. Most of the thesis that we have in China has has absolutely nothing to do with that. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, um, you know certainly just like uh, most of our short thesis in the equity markets globally had nothing to do with COVID. Uh, and I'm not a doctor, and, and I don't not gonna um, uh, pretend to be one. And it's um, you know certainly is uh, there's those are real uncertainties in the markets. So if you if you navigate the market for some time, uh, you know that you're always dealing with uncertainties. But um, and you know my all, all of our theses are nothing is guaranteed. Obviously, those are all uh, just ideas that we have been uh, betting that we have uh, strong conviction on. Um, but um, the COVID situation certainly is a, a true uncertainty that is, is hard to, uh, uh, to have a view on. And, and also um, the flood situation in uh, flooding situation in China, I, I would put as a same uh, type of, uh, of scenario. So I, I don't think I'm the right person to, uh, to give an answer on that, if you don't mind. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, it's better to, to do that than, than give us, you know, something that you pulled out of your ass. But um, we have one final question. Uh, from Bill actually asked this earlier on, wants to know about, let's say, the, the equity sell-off that materializes and, and we get more of a general risk-off. Do you think that there is high risk that it spills over into those gold mining equities and gold and silver? And that is something that anybody who's looking to play into a similar thesis as you should be prepared for, assuming that we do see some, some more selling and more pain. 
Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, I get that question a lot, actually. And it's the whole idea of buying gold and selling stocks that we talk about. And a lot of people, every time I say that, they're like, are you just saying gold? No, I'm saying gold, silver, and miners. And miners can get... Uh, uh, can be can have issues if the equity markets decline. Uh, I think it's important to remember what happened during the Great Depression. Um, in 1929 or so, the miners got caught along with the markets in the first leg down, very similar to what happened in March. And then after that, and companies like Homestake Capital uh, actually started to uh, to rise and, and, and disconnect from the equity markets um, back then. And I think that's highly uh, possible. And that's I, I like the idea of having two asymmetric bets both ways. In other words, not shorting the S&P 500, but shorting the most overvalued current um, companies you can find in the world today. A lot of those are in the tech, uh, are tech names right now. Um, but um, but you can find banks and other uh, other other companies that also look attractive on the short side that ha that can have a lot of downside relative to the overall markets and it can actually offset. Uh, your losses in, in the precious metal space. I will mention that back in March, our hedge funds had a really great performance during even the whole quarter, um, but um, but the precious metal side did not work. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of those companies, some of those miners, I uh, remember some of them being down 50%, 60%. Uh, yeah. We called that the blood on the streets and we bought more. Uh, but still, the shorts offset the losses in the precious metal side. So I think there is uh, the situation we are we are today in terms of how undervalued miners are relative to how overvalued equity markets are. I think that gap is is so asymmetric. Um, so you can find both ways in which you know you don't have to be right on both legs. Um, and that was the case even more recently. You know, our, we just had another great quarter, and they had nothing to do with our shorts. Our shorts actually we're in that short the entire quarter. It lost money in the entire quarter in terms of that part of the, the, the portfolio. But the precious metals went on fire. So, you know, it was quite opposite in the first quarter. So I'm just saying uh, the buy gold and sell stocks idea has been working. I think will continue to work. It actually links back to the idea of, of what we had with the yield curve inversions. If you remember, the last time I was here in, uh, in Real Vision or last two times, whatever that was, um, I was talking about uh, the. We did a comprehensive research looking at the amount of inversions we have in, in the Treasury curve, and what we found is that 70% of all the spreads in the yield curve were inverted. And the best assets to own during periods and when that happened since the 1970s empirically were buying gold and selling stocks. In other words, buying gold uh, to S&P 500 ratio. So all we're doing here is just looking for the most asymmetric bets in both sides. Um, and I think that if you can even improve that by by being short the most overvalued currencies in the world even better um and looking for the best drill stores in the mining space even better um so there are different ways of uh, of of uh, expressing and implementing those those ideas but uh um anyways i, I think it could get caught up on on, on a, on a sell-off um if you ask my my opinion actually in, in a probability is higher that we'll disconnect from the equity markets in the following months uh in my view um but answer your question yeah, as you could. Um, I think that that's, that's a possibility too. Well, I think that, that answer really did tie together a lot of your views and it's a good place for us to leave us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tavi, and uh, I hope you have a, a good day and get back to, to Denver uh, in, in the coming days. Max, thanks for having me and I appreciate it again for the opportunity. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.